और um okay brothers well listen um it's a pleasure to see you again uh i have been through the materials that you all sent uh and i'm grateful for that i have sent them back they were all very good uh, i just sent them back to my brother now if you read them there will be a little patch which is highlighted um in most cases it's just something i wanted to uh you to look at again um normally everything was pretty much pretty much 100% uh and um if you send them to me um maybe in pdf uh it's a little bit more difficult i can write on them very quickly in word um so i've sent them back to francis and francis uh will fix those when we speak again on monday but there's small things that need to be fixed very very small things nothing serious um for example a couple of people just missed out if it was a two part question they just missed out one of the two parts on the question right so okay. uh, so so i i'm i'm very happy with everything up to this point um i want to make one quick note when we talk about the single meaning of the text the one exception to that is typology because in typology god intends something to be understood right there and something to be understood even further in the future so there is that one strange bit that typology is how we talk about yes there is one meaning of the text but uh, let, let's use for example um husbands love your wives um you know back in genesis um with mm. husbands and wives in genesis uh when when we read that they, those are straightforward commands but then we also begin to see as we look at the typology of scripture that it's also pointing us forwards to Christ and his church and so there is a bigger um a wider understanding of what Christ wants us to know so there's just one little caveat that i would put on everybody answer that correctly there is one meaning of the text multiple applications but in fact when god uses typology he actually has more than one meaning right um mm. so um that's um so that's it um right so we are on right now uh, as i understand it we're beginning lesson 4 right mm. and some of lesson 4 you guys have already done i know you've already done it because you've already discussed it in some of your answers with me um so let me just um let me just collapse this and i can see you and see my text at the same time right um let me remove the thing okay right so what we're going to be looking at this time around is old testament prophecy and typology old testament prophecy and typology um and it actually runs into the new testament the principles also run into the new testament so the first thing we need to do which we've already done and you've already answered was to talk about how we um how we fit prophecy in we can talk about the challenge of prophecy um when you read prophecy in the old testament it's often very very long um but it's saying one thing per per prophecy so you know when you get stuck on something which is very very long just remember that it's mainly saying one thing each time so if you read say judgment is coming upon um israel in the book of habakkuk and it has a long description of the judgment just remember that the, the central thing there is that judgment is coming and these are all descriptions about the the um the judgment now there are a couple of things which can be challenging to us when we look at the prophets um in the old testament um one is that they're not chronological often and so we have to figure out the chronology when we get into the prophets and that can be a bit tricky so you do have to do that work if you're preaching from the prophets make sure that you've done the work 
to fit the right chronology in as best as you possibly can, because it will massively aid your understanding. Um, I think one of the things that, um, you know, we didn't pray, so let me, let me pray for us and then we'll carry on. Uh, Father, we do thank you for your son. We thank you for the word of God, which is our life. We are reminded again, these things are what we are to live by. They are mighty. We cannot understand them unless we have the aid of your spirit. And Lord, we would harden our hearts unless you gave us the aid of your spirit. So soften our hearts, give us the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide and to give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, Amen. So, so, so one of the things is try, trying to sort the chronology out. You, you know, the way that the Bible was put together was just the longest books first and then shorter books after that, right? That's the way that we put the prophets together. There was no more thought given than that right? Um, so they're not put in sequence often. They're not put in the right order. So just, you know, be aware of that. As I said, the prophets are very long, but generally when you look at a prophetic passage, it has one major meaning. Um, the other thing that's tricky with the prophets is that they use extreme language, all right? And a good example of that extreme language, which makes it difficult for us to interpret it, is something like Joel chapter 2, um, which, is, which is actually in the New Testament. It's a very, very difficult passage to actually interpret. Joel chapter 2, which is repeated in the book of Acts. For example, it says, the sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the day of the Lord comes, the great and mighty day. Now, what, what did he mean by saying the sun, um, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood? Um, what did he mean by those things? Um, some people have said, well, that's, that's looking at the uh, final second coming. Well, okay, but Peter actually says, these things have been fulfilled in your hearing now, right? Now, that, that creates a challenge for us because, in, you know, th there was no indication that at that time, that those things had happened. So, so what is he meaning by that? And we'll discuss that in some detail later on. So there can be some really, really challenging aspects. Um, oh, Marshall's joining us. There can be some very, very challenging aspects as we go into the actual um, thing. So the, the, the next point I had in your notes was number one, one, the structural framework. Um, you know, there's, there's a couple of ways. If you look in your Bibles, it says the early prophets. Then it says the later prophets. Um, that's one way of doing it. Um, you can divide them into the major prophets and the minor prophets. Uh, normally, just by, by length. All right. That's the way these things are done, by length. So Isaiah is longer than Jeremiah, is longer than Ezekiel, is longer than Daniel. And then you get the shorter ones, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Um, now, um, that, that's, that's two ways of doing it. Uh, the third way is this business of what we talked about as a covenantal prosecutor. Would somebody like to mm -hmm. remind me what I mean by that? And again, you've already dealt with some of this. So what do we mean by covenantal prosecutor? Uh, is one is the one who brings up a charge against the, the children of Israel. Right, right. So based on say, Moses covenant. Right. It's based on the old Mosaic covenant, right? Moses mm -hmm. is really the first of the great prophets uh, and the great prophet and mediator. He has so many roles in the Old Testament. That's why Rose, Moses had such a great uh, position in Jewish thinking, because Moses was the lawgiver. He was the prophet. He was the mediator. He was the interceder. Um, he, he just had this incredible role in, in, in Israel. Um, so, uh, yeah, covenantal prosecutors are bringing charges against um, Israel for the breach of their sin. And we've looked at things, we already looked at things like Deuteronomy and Leviticus, which you've already done, the fourfold part of Leviticus. If you, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, uh, I will curse you. Um, 
you will disobey me. So Francis, that was a small correction on your answer. Number three, you will disobey me. Um, okay. And therefore I will cast you out of that. He tells them that beforehand. Okay. And then yes. I will bring you back. Back. And, and remember when you read Israel, um, when you read, you, you have to think of Israel as one, the history of Israel as one person. So God deals with Israel over the whole of her history, but as one person, right? Um, so, so you see, you know, um, uh, when they're disobedient, they get chastened. When they're obedient, they get blessed. But in the history of Israel, eventually she is so disobedient that she must be cast out. And what you're really reading there is a lesson, and, and this is how you need to think about it. It's a lesson for the whole world. As they mm -hmm. read the history of Israel, so they see how God deals with people and his children. So it is an objective witness to the world. So your government, my government, the, the, the American government should be reading and going, when Israel obeyed, they received God's blessing. We yes, need sir. to obey and we will receive God's blessing. And they, they won't do it, right? Um, mm -hmm. And also, of course, it applies directly to the church. Um, so, so that's the big point. And we've already covered this. Um, you know, when you start, you've got pre-exilic prophets. And then they go and the warning that they're going to go into exile. Then they do. And God brings them back. Um, and the bringing back is 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 in the um, in the uh, in the Old Testament in bringing them back. Um, the, um, the, the 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 it's very very simply put in Leviticus, and it's very simply put in uh, Deuteronomy, because it's just the beginning. Remember, progressive revelation, and somebody got this wrong on the sheet, so I'm just correcting it. Progressive revelation is when you start something, it's a small river. And it's just giving you the basic principles. But as the river goes towards the sea, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so as we follow the biblical promises from Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and if we follow those same promises into um, Isaiah, now Isaiah has a lot to say about the new heavens and the new earth. And the blessings, because that's progressive revelation. He's saying the same thing. I will bring you back. I will establish you. I will bless you. Um, but he's saying basically the same thing, um, but in a more expanded version. Um, and so, you know, remember when you go back to those four things, it was a big thing in my understanding uh, when I began to understand more about the Bible when I realized that those four things in Deuteronomy controls all of the prophets. And the promises that you're seeing in Isaiah about the lion and the lamb and the blessings and the fig tree and the vine and all of those promises are promises which were basically in basic form back in Deuteronomy uh, versus uh, Deuteronomy 31 through 6. And also in the end of Leviticus, same thing. That's the connection. That's the new covenant promises. It doesn't say in Deuteronomy, when I bring you back, it will be the new covenant. It doesn't say that, but that's what it is. Right? So make that connection. I will bless. If you obey, I will bless. If you don't obey, I will curse. I will. You will disobey. I will throw you out and I will bring you back. And put my law in your heart. And that fourth one is the new covenant. Right? That's the history of Israel from the time of Moses all the way through to the time of, of Christ. Okay? Um, if you look at the prophets then, any, any questions on that? I think we're all clear on that, right? I'm clear. I've understood what you've said. Good, good. So, so good. So now you've got a framework, I think. Um, if you look at the main covenantal charges, idolatry and syncretism, um, those are the just these are just headings that you'll find that repeat themselves. 
The charges mm -hmm. are you have become idolatrous, mm -hmm. you've turned away. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's direct idolatry. Huh? Oh, you've turned away. You're worshiping Baal. Or sometimes it's indirect idolatry. We worship Jehovah, but under the form of a golden calf, right? Mm -hmm. And that's just the same thing. It's just indirect, all right? Um, uh, uh, right. Um, failure of social justice. Um, you know, God loves the poor. God loves the needy. God, we are poor and needy. But God particularly loves those who are disadvantages. And so that's where all of those special care for the widows, the orphans, the foreigners, and the weak. And to make sure that we do not despise the weak. Um, uh, religious ritualism. Uh, that's the third one. When we, and again, we just, we go to, we go to church because we go to church. We fast, but we don't really mean it our relationship isn't right with the lord and so making sure the heart is there first right and you get it in hosea you get it in micah you get it in a whole bunch of places um and then the restoration passages um as we've said the lord will circumcise i've already said this but let me just read to deuteronomy the lord will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring um, that you will love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live, and then those are further developed, right? Um, mm. And you see exactly, you see exactly those things being further developed in Ezekiel and Isaiah, and all of those things uh, in the New Covenant. Um, great. Are we okay with that? Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Yes. Now here's one My thing. Sorry, go ahead. Marshall has joined us. Yes, I see Marshall's joined us. Good to see you, Marshall. We can't, we know it's you because it says Marshall, but we can't see your face. The light yeah, just, did... There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now, one thing I did want to mention, which is confusing. Um, I don't know. People, to I people. cannot. Yeah, sorry. Marshall? Marshall, you want to try and Marshall. You were saying something, Marshall. Oh, we've lost his uh, direct contact. All right. Now, one other thing that you just have to bear in mind, and this gets people into trouble, um, is that there are often multiple fulfillments of a prophecy. Um, and again, this goes back to our typology. There's one underlying principle, but in typology, it can have more than one fulfillment. Um, and, and this, uh, this, I can illustrate this idea um, in a number of ways, um, but but basically, um, let's look at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is interesting is in the Old Testament, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't clearly split into a first coming and a second coming, right? For us, we clearly see the split between the first coming and the second coming. But if you go back and look at the prophets of the Old Testament, they were not clearly split between the first coming and the second coming. They didn't have a clear split between both of those. Right. Um, and so when we when we look at both of those, um, when we look at that and, and a good illustration of this is John the Baptist. Um, can you remember the story when, when John the Baptist, um, he doesn't understand what Jesus is doing? So Jesus comes, John the Baptist sees Jesus, he baptizes Jesus, he sees that Jesus is the Christ, and then a little while later, right, 
we find out that John the Baptist is confused. And he says, are you the Christ or do we wait for another? Now, why is John confused in that situation, do you think? Now, why is John confused in that situation? Well, the, the answer is because he's thinking that there's one coming of the Messiah. And when Messiah comes, he will bring forth justice and righteousness. And he will defeat all of Israel's enemies. But John is in prison. Now, why is John in prison? Because the enemies of the gospel are still triumphing over John, right? So the enemies are still triumphing over John. And John says, wait a minute, you, you are the one who comes to establish your people, to save them, to bring them blessings, and I'm in prison. Are you the Christ or are you not the Christ? And the problem that John doesn't realize and has to learn is that the, the Old Testament prophesied of one coming of Messiah. And in the New Testament, we see that the one coming gets moved into two comings. It's not that they contradicted. It's just that it didn't, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't made clear in the old that it would be two comings, not one coming. So let me give you an example of, of how Jesus deals with the problem. And uh, this, is an, this is where Jesus reads in Luke's gospel. Jesus reads um, about his own ministry. And it's very interesting to see how Jesus does this. He picks up the scroll of Isaiah. And he reads from Isaiah. And what he reads is, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he stops at that point. Jesus stops there. But the next words are, and the day of vengeance of our God. Now, he stops because the first coming of Jesus is to come with grace, and the second coming is to come with judgment, right? So if he was to read the whole of Isaiah, then he would have to do everything, and John would be right. John would be saying, you've come to bring vengeance. Where are you? Why are you not blessing us? Why are you not helping us? Right? Um, why am I in prison? Why are the enemies of the gospel who hate your name in, in trial? And the reason is because Jesus stopped short of that last clause, the day of vengeance of our God. So go away and look at that if you read it. Um, if you read it uh, in the um, in Luke's gospel. Um, um, you will see that Jesus does not put those words in. He closes up the scroll and he leaves it. So the Old Testament tended to collapse the first and second coming of the Lord. But when you start to read messianic passages in the Old Testament, they collapse the first and second coming. But when you read the passages... Uh, and, and you see what Jesus does to Isaiah. And we see how Jesus answers John the Baptist. We're realizing that he's teaching us and he's teaching the Jews. And he's teaching even John the Baptist, who is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets after Moses, right? He's even teaching John the Baptist, wait, there's a first coming and a second coming. And this is still the day of the Okay. No. Is everybody good with that? Yes, we are. I'm following. Yeah. Right, right. So, so, so go away when we finish this. Go away and read the Isaiah passage 
and read how Jesus deals with it in Luke's gospel. And you'll see what I'm talking about. And then go and also read the section in John, um, um, where, where John actually warns them about, um, about Jesus actually says to John, yes, I am the Messiah. Um, and, um, and he just needs to wait because this is still a day of grace. And, and we know John loses his head. Um, and he's got to wait by faith until Jesus comes the second time and justice will reign completely and God, Jesus will enforce the justice of his reign. Okay. Um, I, I just want to other make a couple of other small points which are going to come up again later when we get, for example, to the book of Revelation, um, which is there is a restrictive perspective and language of the prophets when you read the prophets one of the reasons why the prophets seem to say something uh, for us quite different to what sometimes we see jesus doing and they do at times right i mean john the baptist is a good illustration of that right why um when we see jesus doing something slightly different to what we expect Part of the problem is that the prophets are prophesying at the space and the time in which they are in, and they don't have words to talk about what's happening to us today, right? So, for example, if you were living in, in, uh, in the first century and you wanted to give an image of power, what images of power would you think about that would show me... Um, uh, 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 yeah, power in the Old Testament, and what images of power would you use today in Zambia? Because they wouldn't necessarily be the same image, would it? They wouldn't be the uh, same come image. again? What were you saying? No. Okay, yeah. Uh, if you were doing... If, okay. okay, if I wanted to ask you, give me a symbol of power and light give me a symbol of power and light um and speed let me give you let me give you those three and and you were in the first century what images would you use to communicate with the people then power light and speed uh can i try yeah uh, for power, it was uh, the number of horses with chariots. That's a good illustration, yeah. And uh, in, in essentially, you can also show that uh, you have a camel for transport and other things. That is the first century. Right, so what about light? The light in the first century. Hello? Yeah, yeah. For the light in the first century, uh, basically, the symbol to, to be used is uh, uh, maybe the way of uh, living. Well, what about, what about, I mean, just the simple one is just a torch, right? Yeah. Right? Mm. A torch. You know, uh, uh, in America, they call them different things, so I have to watch my language, right? So a flashlight, it's a torch, something that you... It just burns, and that's used a lot. Or the light of the sun is actually used a lot as an image. Now, if we were talking today, and I said, give me an image of power, what would you do? What would you, if you were to, just, you couldn't speak to me, you could just draw something. What would you draw, which is an image of power? The army. Yeah, AK-47. The uh, army, a, a, a nuclear missile, and you know, mostly it's a nuclear plant which you have, which you can boast about. It's a nuclear plant. Yeah, you, you'd you'd use something like that as an image. But remember, these things were developed later. So when the prophets are making a point using the images, they've got to use images of the time. So horses, chariots. Chariots were like tanks, right? Um, 
Uh, flying, winged creatures, fast, speed. We, we might use a jet or we might use a car for speed, right? So we have a, a range of things that we can we can do and we can use. Um, so um, uh, I'll uh, you know let's um so so let's uh we'll, we'll see what happens um with that um so just remember as you as you uh as you read the prophets. They are limited, again, to the time and to the space that they're in. They use concepts from that time and space. And if you're going to be a good interpreter, you have to understand what those concepts mean and bring them out into the present, right? And use them, you know, in the same way. Right. Um. So that's one thing with the prophets. The other problem and, and trouble that we have, and I'm just focusing on the bits that are troublesome, which are difficult for us if we're honest, right? The other is that the prophets used a lot of highly figurative language, um, mm -hmm. which is very difficult for us to hold in. And let me, let me give you something that you might have thought about that you might have not thought about. I've already talked to you about Joel. How Joel is difficult. You know, the sun will not give its light. The moon will not be turned to blood. And Peter says, today, these things have been fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, well, hang on a minute. What, what, what do we mean, right? Um, the same thing occurs with John the Baptist. Because we see in the wilderness, and I'm, I'm at 136 in your notes. Um, in, in, in Isaiah 40, there's a promise. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill shall be made low. Uh, the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, you know, this is very difficult to interpret. At one level, we say, oh, John the Baptist is the guy, right? But do we actually see John with a bulldozer, you know, making, making everything level? Do we see him doing those things? Um, and, and the answer is, the answer is no, we don't see John doing this. So it's very figurative language that is often used in the Old Testament. And for us to interpret it correctly and fully is very difficult. We can often do a quick interpretation, but it's not a full interpretation. And we leave stuff out, right? And we don't know what to do with it. I mean, I've never preached through that section on Acts 2, which I've already told, talked to you, because I'm not entirely sure what it means. I know that it's Old Testament. I know it's using Old Testament images because he's limited by Old Testament images. I know it has a bigger meaning, which is obviously pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, uh, but exactly how I interpret that, I have to be very, very careful. Oh, is everybody tracking with me about the difficulty? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you're going to see that when you interpret some of the prophets, you know generally what they're saying, um, but getting into the specifics can be very, 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 very difficult. I'll give you another example. Um, we say in theology that God knows the full number of the elect and that there'll be no more male and female in heaven because um, we'll be like the angels, right? That's what Christ teaches. You'll be like the angels in heaven. Uh, so we might be male, but female, but we won't certainly be married and given in marriage. Um, and so, um, so we we see these things. Um, where was I going to go? Oh, I've just, oh, yeah. So in Isaiah, it says the young child. So are we looking for young children in heaven, or are we? You know, the young child will play with the ass. You know what I mean? When we start to get into those complexities, it becomes very, very difficult for us to understand what the prophet's speaking about. 
and I think we have to fall back on there is a, a certain amount of poetic and figurative language going on. Poetic and figurative. And for poetry, you are trying in poetry, and we're gonna, this is our next topic is poetry. But in poetry, you're not trying to be literal. You're trying to give a sense of something, right? You're trying to give a feeling of something um, rather than trying to give a strict literal interpretation. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Um, it says in Psalm 2, which is poetic and prophetic, right? It's both because there's overlap here. It says in Psalm 2, um, he will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Now, is he trying to say literally Jesus is sitting in heaven and he has an iron stick in his hand and he's literally pointing it and ruling the nations with a rod of iron? No. Right. So, so what is the what is he what, what is he trying to say then if he's not saying that? What is it saying? there what's the feeling if i said somebody is ruling with a rod of iron what's the feeling that it brings to you uh it's it uh, can i try yeah please uh well essentially what he's saying we are saying we are saying that uh, that particular person who's ruling is ruling with a hard arm very strict it, it, it could be a hard way or it could be an absolute way, uh, right? So the, the iron is not the point. What's the point is the, the feeling. And then you're seeing there's a king. And as we see him, the nation's rebelling. We see that he is still ruling them with a rod of iron. He is in absolute control and he will crush them. The nations who are in rebellion against him, right? So, so again, this is where this is where some of the poetry and the expressions we we have to say. There's, you know, we have to say some of it is limited by the time. It's limited by the the um, images that they have, and it's limited by the uh, yeah the time, the images that they have. And it's also limited by um, the, uh, the, 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 the type of literature, which is figurative. And we have to therefore interpret things in a very challenging, it can be quite challenging about how we interpret it. Right, so those are the things that I wanted to highlight. Um, and I think all I've done is probably raised more problems than solutions, right? Um, but that's as far as we're going to go here, just to make you aware that when you start to read the prophets of the Old Testament, to try to understand how they speak of Christ, so that you're aware that it, 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 it might collapse the first coming and the second coming of Christ, it might not pull them apart, and that some of the stuff is figurative. Um, now, that doesn't make you a liberal, okay? That's the catch here, right? When you say, oh, something is figurative, if it was the author's intention to use a figure of speech, then you are being a faithful exegete, right? If, on the other hand, it was the author's intention to be absolutely literal, and you say he's being figurative, then you're being a liberal, right? Because that was how a lot of the discussion evolved um, at the time. Um, of the 1800s, the German, the German liberalism came out, and German liberalism said, according to it, oh, you can't take the Bible seriously, it's all figurative, or it's all just story pictures, right? And in contrast, people came back, uh, American fundamentalists and others came back and said, no, 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 it's all absolutely literal. That was their response. This is absolutely literal. And the problem with that response is, wait, some of it isn't. Some of it is figurative. Not in the way that the German liberals were using it the way. But the author's intention, the Holy Spirit, under the, and, the, and, the, and the Trinity, 
author's intention was to use figurative language in order that he might proper communicate something in a slightly different way. And that's how we walk between extreme literalism and how we walk between um, figurative sort of extreme literalism and then liberal figuratism where we say, oh no, the, the miracles don't really tell you anything. They're just stories to tell you something nice but they never really happen, right? So we, we have to be those who walk between those with a proper hermeneutic. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. Yeah. And, and it can be a challenge. Yes. Um, I mean, I'm just really highlighting the challenges, not necessarily the solution. Right, typology. Let's go on to typology. Uh, just, you know, everything is typology. So I'm going to work this very, very quickly. Um, you can see in your notes, uh, Jesus actually uses the word typology. Uh, in the Gospels, it actually uses the word tupos, which means something that leaves a mark or a blow. So if I push my, if I had a pen and I pushed hard into, into my finger, you would see the mark, right? Mm. That, that is the type. This is the reality. This is the picture that you can now see. And this is the reality. And that's the word tupos, which is used in the Old Testament. And again, it's very, very important as a hermeneutical tool. The Bible is full of typology. And if you don't recognize that, we're going to get into a lot of trouble, right? So the typology of the temple, um, the typology of the priesthood under Aaron. Um, there's so many types that if you just stop, you're not doing justice to everything. Um, Jesus talks about typology in the New Testament. Um, uh, when he talks about Thomas, put your hand into my side. That, that you know, Jesus isn't pointing to the spear, but he's pointing to the mark that the spear made. Uh, Jesus also talks about typology when he talks about lifting up. Um, you know, the, the the one that we all know, right? Uh, the one that we all know is the lifting up of the bronze serpent, and we know that in the Old Testament. The, the bronze serpent was lifted up. Moses said, look to it. Those who looked, lived. Even though they were being bitten, those who looked, lived. Right? And Jesus says, in the same way, I will be lifted up. And that's a clear illustration of, of typology. All right? Um, now, what this means practically, um, what this means practically, though, is that when we read and preach... From the Old Testament, we must be looking for this typology, not analogy. And we're going to talk about the difference, right? Because we've already said, um, and you guys already said, we don't believe in allegory, right? We don't believe in allegory interpretation. But we do believe in a typological interpretation. And, and that's vital for us to understand, all right? So, so the, the Old Testament, and I've said this to you many times, is full of typology. The Old Testament is filled with typology. So the lifting up of the serpent, um, all sorts of things. Um, that's, that's, all done, um, that's all done typologically um, in, in, the same, in the same way. Um, Right, let me let me think for a second. Um, typos, typological. Um, so if you were preaching, for example, if you're preaching on David defeating Goliath, what's the typology there? What's the typology of David and Goliath? Hmm. Can I try? Yeah, please. <laughs> it might be sound very allegorical. Uh, Goliath can uh, stand for the wicked nation or the wicked kingdom. 
How, how about how about the king, who who is the representative, defeats all of our enemies who are more powerful than us, which would be Satan. Right, a strong man uh, arm. You know, and I would I would say to you that if you were preaching from David and Goliath, the first hmm. thing you have to do is you have to preach about what happened with David and Goliath. But I would also say to you that with David and Goliath, it's a clear picture pointing to Christ defeating all of his enemies. Um, again, by faith, right? And by by hmm. I mean he. Uh, in the New Testament. <laughs> yeah, it's by faith that uh, David killed uh, Goliath. Right, and trust in the Lord um, mm -hmm. and trust in his God. So you see the same thing happening. And so there's a lot of typology which is there. And if I was preaching from the Old Testament, I would almost invariably push it forward into the New Testament. I'd preach the first bit which was David, Goliath, faith, trust, um, the honor of God. There are many lessons that you could learn. And then I would switch it around and I would then, um, I would look at it from, a, from the other side, the other perspective. Okay. Um. So, so, so that's what I would, uh, that's what I would, that's how I would do it, uh, you know, um, and that's, I think, legitimate typology. I would be looking for things, typological things. When you see, when you're preaching on the sacrifice, that's an easy one. When you're preaching on the temple, that's an easy one. Uh, when you're preaching on Moses as the great mediator of the old covenant, uh, let me give you some examples. You might not have thought about this, about Moses, but Moses, Moses starts by being put to death, doesn't it? The story of Moses is how Moses is going to be put to death. But Moses is literally, his name means to be drawn out. He's in the river, he's going to die, and God draws him out. Then Moses, of course, grows up, and then Moses comes forward to be the deliverer, and then spends 40 years in the wilderness being humble, right? And in the same way, Christ grows up, and then he spends 40 days being tempted of the devil in the wilderness and, and learning the lessons. And then he comes back in the power of the spirit to deliver, just like Moses comes back in the power of the spirit to deliver. Right. And so you can keep Moses as the one who prays for Israel constantly in the same way Christ is praying for us. So as you study Moses, so you'll be given insight into what Christ will do. So I would include all of that typologically, right, um, into the New Testament. Now, there's a difference, as you said. We don't want to become allegorical, but we do want to be typological. And that's the challenge that we have. If you're going to preach a full gospel on the text, I would always go into the New Testament from the Old Testament. Um, I would let me let me give you another example. Um, you know, Samson is, is is in a sense a type of Christ, um, and there, there are many things like that that you can you can pull together um, and bring out. Now, always though, you have to be careful. We're not going back to allegory now. Um, I've got some some principles in your notes under two two. How do we distinguish between um, allegory and how do we distinguish between typology? And I've got four things that will help you. Uh, these were given to me by a lecturer at RTS many years ago. Um, so in typology, the Old Testament and the New Testament are actual historical things. So you have David in the Old Testament, and you have Christ in the New Testament. They are actual historical things. David is defeating Goliath. Jesus is defeating Satan. Actual historical things. Right? Um, yeah. Next, there must be a correspondence between them. A correspondence between them. So, so David is the king. 
who is the one who is going to deliver his people. So there's a clear correspondence between David and the people and the people and David, right? So uh, there you see the correspondence and you'll get the same correspondence with Christ. So you, you can see the real correspondences which go on there. Uh, the Passover, sometimes we're actually told, you know, Jesus is the Passover lamb. Um, that's a good illustration. Thirdly, um, uh, let's, just, let's just talk about the Passover. Was the Passover historical? Yes, it was. Is it was. Jesus historical? Yes, he is. Yes. Right. So, so we've got something there, right? Um, and actually, Paul tells us, Jesus, our Passover, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. So that, this is going to help us to keep in the boundaries and not step out sideways. All right? And you can look at your notes for that. The third thing is there must be a heightening. Because if your type is in the Old Testament, it has to be less than the glory of the New Testament. Right? Mm. So if the type is in the old, when David defeats Goliath, wonderful. But Jesus defeats Satan. That's intensification. Um, uh, the Passover protected the life of the firstborn in Israel. Jesus' blood protects us from eternal hell, not just life in this life. So there's intensification moving from one to another. And, and the last point that we have, which is summarizes, really, this is a summary, is what was God's intention? What was God's intention, right? Um, and we use the, the three things above to try and figure out that intention. So is it actual history? Then it was God's intention that we should see typology. Notable correspondence, then the closer the correspondence, then there's more than it was supposed to be typology. And then was there an intensification or a heightening? Well, again, that will help us to be, um, to be that. Right? Um, so you get a good uh, application um, of, say, Melchizedek in your notes. Uh, people, Melchizedek. He points forward to Christ. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of peace. That tells us about the Lord Jesus. He's not of the line of Aaron. But Jesus arose from a different line, right? So, so there are many things here that, 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 that we can use. So, so we talk about people being types. We talk about events being types. Okay. Uh, the greatest event in the Old Testament, which is a type, is the Exodus, right? If you said to me, uh, where do I study the most in the Old Testament to learn about salvation in the New Testament? I would point you to the Exodus, right? Understanding the Exodus is the great way that we need to understand the types and the shadows going forward, right? Um, and then, and then um, officers, we know that a king is a king, Jesus is a king, a uh, priest mm -hmm. is a priest, all right, all of those, right, are, are given to us, so um, places, officers, people, events, all of them can be types, but just control your typology by using that fourfold test that I gave you. Otherwise, you're going to spin typology out into all sorts of areas, which you shouldn't do. Um, there, there is a lot of typology which is expressly mentioned in the New, uh, in the New Testament, but at the same time, there is a lot of typology which is not expressly mentioned. And we know that because the writer to the Hebrews says, there are many more things that I want to write to you about the tabernacle, but you are not old enough and mature enough to receive them. So he could have written a lot longer book because there were so many more things. But he did highlight some things for us. Right? And, and again... What are our principles 
uh, that we use so that we don't spin out of control. Okay. Um, again, guys, I've gone fast, but but how are we uh, how are we with this typology issue? Right. It's incredibly important, and um, you mustn't overdo it, and you mustn't underdo it. If you if you overdo it, you're going to fall into uh, allegory. Allegory. If you underdo it, you are not going to be putting the importance of type to fulfillment that runs through the whole of scripture. Mm. Uh, any comments? It's clear to me. Good. I'm glad it's clear to you because it. We all struggle with it. <laughs> I struggle with it. <laughs> um, you know, when when do I take the story of David and Goliath and move it into the story of Jesus defeating his enemies? You know, mm. these are the questions that we we, we face. Um, um, okay, good. Um, right. Um, I just want to look, I, I just want to remind you, and I, I think I did this with you guys last time. Um, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, did I do this with you last time? I can't remember. Um, but Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 gives us this hermeneutic of type um, very, very clearly. Um, when he says, um, he goes back to the Old Testament and he says, guys, the stuff that you read about in the Old Testament, it's not just for the Old Testament. It is to be drawn into the New Testament today for us. Right? So we get Paul in 1 Corinthians 10. I'm in your lecture notes uh, under number 24, uh, page 82. Uh, and I want to uh, just read this to you. Just listen to Paul's words. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers, this is the Jews, were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Right? Moses is the mediator of the old covenant, and so they're all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So there you're seeing Christ is in that Old Testament picture. Old Testament. And if, 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 yeah, if you're preaching through the Exodus, and if you're preaching through the wilderness, you know, you better have Christ in there all the time, right? Nevertheless, that's that typology. With most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. So, Paul makes a number of comments. The Jewish church is the father of all, both Jew and Gentile. Israel was baptized into Moses. We are baptized into Christ. Right? Because one of the things that Moses is saying is God will send another prophet like me. Deuteronomy. Uh, yeah, Deuteronomy 18. Yeah, 15 through 18. One of the absolutely vital passages. Um. Then the one who provided all the blessings to Israel was Christ. So Christ is active in the Old Testament, not as the God-man yet, because he's not the God-man yet, right? But he is active in the Old Testament, in the cloud and in the sea and in the activities. Those who disobeyed, God judged them in the wilderness and they could not enter the promised land. And then he goes on to draw implications for us today. Now, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did do not be idolatrous as some of them were as it is written the people sat down to eat and rose up to play right we must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did and twenty-three thousand fell in a single day we must not put christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents Right? Nor grumble, as some as those did, or were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages has come. 
So he says, yes, these things happen. Yes, we should understand them and we should apply those principles to us today. Okay? Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, I've given you the outline. I've, I've talked to you about the problems. I think I've given you more problems than solutions. But remember, this is an introductory text. So we're just trying to open up and give you um, the tools for you to uh, begin to think seriously about Old Testament prophecy and typology. Um, and, and really, those are absolutely vital tools um, for you to think about. I mean, I think I've hit most of the big tools. You have to then go back and start to ask yourself the question, how am I going to preach through Joel chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2? You know, challenging, challenging. How am I going to preach? Uh, John the Baptist is a voice crying in the wilderness, um, making the prophet straight, figurative language. Like that. Okay, uh, we've been going for a while now. Let me ask you, what it, it's now what? What time is it out there now? Uh, nine zero nine nine eleven p.m. Yeah, we, we've probably done. I'd hope to do more, but we've probably done as much as we can. Um, I want you to. Uh, I, I think we we probably need to stop because it's already nine. I can do a little bit on poetry if you'd like. Um, very very quickly, I can do some on Hebrew poetry. Um, most of this is very self-explanatory. Um. But what I want to put across to you um, uh, is, is the differences in poetry. You know, let, let me just take 10 more minutes or 15 minutes. Can I take 10 or 15 minutes? No problem. Okay. So again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to explain the challenges and the difficulties that you find with, with, when you deal with Hebrew uh, poetry. Um, I personally... Uh, I don't read much poetry. I just don't, it just doesn't excite me. English poetry, it doesn't, it doesn't excite me, right? Um, but the point that I want to make is that poetry in each culture of the world is very different. It's like music. It's very different in each culture of the world. And the challenge that you have as Zambians is to understand Hebrew poetry as they Hebrews would have understood it. That is the challenge uh, that you have, right? Because it's a cross-cultural thing, right? Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and understand that by asking ourselves some basic questions, which are very, very simple questions. What is poetry? Um, what are we trying to do with poetry? So let me ask you this question. What's the difference between mathematics and poetry? Uh, poetry, can I try? Yes, please. Whoever, whoever's, whoever wants to jump uh, poetry in. Actually, uh, poetry actually gives us the feeling of a particular situation. What's the theory? Wow, mathematics. You said mathematics? Yes, mathematics. Uh, mathematics gives us a tangible or a practical thing of a particular uh, figure, a situation. Right. If, 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 you're, if you're driving uh, over a bridge, yeah, if you're uh, driving over a bridge, I want to know that the mathematics of that bridge have been correctly built, right? Mm. It's hard numbers. That's all it is. It's information. It's not to make me feel anything. Mm -hmm. But poetry is designed to evoke feelings and evoke emotions, right? And that's how when we read Hebrew poetry, we are to approach the text. It is trying to generate emotions in us deliberately. So it's not, so, so for example, again, a silly illustration. Um, in, in the Psalms, it says the hills clap their hands. Well, if that's mathematics, 
then we have a problem because I've never seen a hill with hands and I've never seen a hill capping its hands, right? But if it's poetry, it's trying to say something which is the hills rejoice, the hills are happy. That is the, if the hills could, could clap their hands, that's what they would be doing because God is the Lord. And, and so that's what we do. And in your notes, I've got a difference between what I call denotation and connotation. All right? Denotation, denotation is mathematics. Trying to be explicit. Connotation is trying to generate a, a, a sense and an emotion inside the person that you're dealing with. So denotation and connotation. Um, and, and, um, and so um, uh, let, let's, uh, let's, let's use what I said earlier. He will rule with a rod of iron. Denotation says iron, rule, and just follows the words like math. Connotation says, oh, what, what's he trying to say here? Ah, the absolute rulership, the absolute glory of Christ, how he will crush his enemies who stand up against him. So you're reading the same text, but if you read it with denotation or, 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 or denotation, you're reading it very literally, very plainly. You're not letting it, it generate the emotions that it should. Connotation is to generate the emotions. And Hebrew is very, very like that. It's very, very structured around trying to generate uh, the feelings in something. Um, if I asked you to describe uh, God's sovereignty, or God's omniscience, that God is everywhere, right? Uh, you, could, you could describe it in systematic theology terms, and you could say, God is everywhere, there is nowhere that God is not positive. You would describe it negatively. You could do it like that. But if you go to Psalm 139, and you read Psalm 139, David describes God's sovereignty, but listen to how he does it. If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in shul, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, does God have a right hand and a left hand? Well, in Jesus, he does actually. Um, but in the Old Testament... No, God is spirit. These are things generating a, a child putting out his hand and God leading by his hand. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light about me shall be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. So again, same thing. We get the same, um, the same principle you know, you understand, he's trying, the, he's saying God is sovereign. If you asked a Westerner like me to describe the sovereignty of God, I would very quickly say God is everywhere. There is no place where God has been. Um, but a Hebrew, like David, expresses it like this. And that's trying to generate impact it can make you feel it not just read it right um, now the other thing i want to just mention about hebrew literary techniques is repetition um the, the hebrews love using repetition and once you begin to see this you're going to read the psalms and you'll just see it in the psalms all over the place right they're saying the same thing but they are repeating themselves by parallel. So let me give you an example from Psalm 93. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. 
The floods lift up their roaring. Right? So this is this is repetition to make the point. Repeat, repeat. Many cases when you read the Psalms, they're saying the same thing in a slightly different way. But they're just repeating the same thing. Um let me let me uh let me give you another one. This is in your notes again. I'm just jumping ahead here. Um to Psalm um Psalm 13. Now look at the parallel. How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? Can you see the parallel that's being it's the same thing that's being said, right? Where how long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? Um, and then again, look at the next, uh, uh, the next ride. How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day long? It's another parallel, right? Um, so, so when you read the Psalms, there are often two lines are saying something very, very similar, right? Very, very similar each particular time. Um, and they're building that each particular time. Um, and it gives balance. So when you read the Psalms, you start to look for the parallels. Look for the words and the, the ideas which run together. Uh, if you go to your notes under 222, I've actually divided it up. So you can see what a parallel looks like. Uh, oh Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? And then who shall dwell on your holy hill? And you can see the parallels there that 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 um that are actually in the uh, in the tent. All right. So in your tent is paralleled with the holy hill. Our gods. Um, uh, God's tent in Jerusalem is on in the city of Judea or in the city of Jerusalem, which is on the mountain. Right? So to go up the holy hill is to go into God's tent. It's the same thing. It's just being said the same way. Who shall sojourn? And again, who, who is there, right? Who shall sojourn? Who shall dwell? So there's a lot of parallelism um, that you see all the way through, and you need to just be very aware and start to pick it up so that you're looking for that parallelism. And by the way, everything that I'm teaching you about the parallelism in Scripture actually will come out in the New Testament as well. You see a lot of it when you read Paul's writings on his letters. He uses the same forms of parallelism in his letters that he does um in in because he's a jew right so mm -hmm. when he writes his letters this sort of thinking is in his mind and he, you, you're going to see that from time to time as you get better you'll see more and more of it okay? now um what types of parallelism well the, the, the main one that we see is similar parallelism so we see, O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Same parallelism. Rebuke, discipline, anger, wrath. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord, because I am languishing. Heal me, O oh God, for my bones are troubled. Right? So we get a lot of parallelism, man. You should be looking for that. Similar ideas. All right? Same or similar. Sometimes we get the reverse. Um, we get opposites deliberately put to us. Uh, and we see those a lot in the Proverbs. So a wise woman builds her house, but folly with her own hands tears it down. So the wisest of women builds her house. What's the opposite? Folly, not wisdom. And she will tear it down rather than building it up. Right? Um, so
So sometimes the parallelism is building and is the same. Sometimes it can be a complete opposite. The opposites occur more in the, in the Proverbs than anywhere else, right? Um, and the, um, uh, right, so, um, and then I've got under 222, 2233, two, developing parallels. In developing the parallel, the idea or thoughts of the first line are developed and extended and even completed in the second line. So we get uh, Psalm verses 1 2. Um, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates all day light. All day, so all day and night. So the psalmist begins by calling the law his delight, and then shows he meditates on it day and night. And so he's building. It's a positive and a building thing, right? Um, so we often get developing parallels and then climactic parallels. Right, the floods have lifted up, O oh Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their roaring. It brings things to a climax. Uh, the negative, mightier than the thunder of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty, and He brings it to a conclusion. <coughs> so, um, as we see these things, these are the sort of parallels. Now, very quickly, um. Uh, you've all done chiasms, haven't you? Have you done chiasms yet? Yes. I know we talk about it. Yeah. We have done them. Yeah, we good. Did. You don't need to go there. You've done it. I don't need to do it. Um, <coughs> and then just to just to talk about figures of speech. Um, oh. the same thing. Um, it's yeah. to evoke uh, an impression. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Let's stop at that point for a moment. Is everybody sort of? Up? I know we're rushing a little bit, but I think uh, I don't know. Like on the figure of speech, uh, I wouldn't know for my my friends, but I did the uh, figure of speech somewhere. Yeah. Figures, the purpose of figures of speech. What's the, what's the difference between a, 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 a simile and a metaphor? A simile and a metaphor. A, a similar is a comparison, actually, where you're comparing something to something. Uh, you compare something great to a, a lesser thing. But a simile is an indirect. You use in English, in English, we use the word like or as. So something he is, he will be like a tree planted by streams of water. Right? So it's an indirect comparison. A metaphor is when you say he is a tree by rivers of water. It's it's more direct, more powerful, right? So if I say a greedy man is like a pig, that's a parallel, but it's not a complete parallel, okay? Well, if I said a greedy man is a pig, it's more powerful, or you are a pig, it's more powerful, right? Yeah. And that's what you get, metaphors, similes, um, and you get this one in, in Peter, all flesh is like grass, which we know from Isaiah. And then if you go back to Isaiah, it says all flesh is grass. And it's more powerful when it's a metaphor than when it's a simile. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Look, I, I think we're going to close it down now. Um, well, I'll let you guys finish up uh, the, the bit on poetry. And then, God willing, when we meet on at 7 o'clock your time, 
on Monday. Monday. We'll try, and I, I don't think we'll finish. I was hoping we'd finish. But we'll, we'll do two at least. And the two that I want to do with you are um, the letters of Paul and uh, uh, parables. Okay, thank you. Right. One third of Jesus' teaching is parables. Um, just another thing to mention to you. Thank you for doing the work. I've all sent it all back. I read it. I'm happy. Uh, our brother Francis will enter it into the, the study center book. Uh, you all get 100%. There's some small things, and I will talk to you later about the small things, but they were very, very small things where people made some small little mistakes. And, uh, and I'll speak to you about those small little mistakes later. But very happy about that. So thank you for doing all of that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Do we see you then at seven o'clock on Monday night? Sure, sure. Okay. Uh, okay, would somebody sure. pray for us? Okay. Okay, let's pray. pray. Okay. We, we thank you, O oh Lord, for the time we spent in studying your word. We do realize that some things are hard to understand. And yet, O oh Lord, we also realize that you we have the spirit to lead us to these things. Help us to understand them. Help us to realize it's their difficulty and how we are to go about them. Let these lessons to us that they might not be just academics, but they might see that might affect our lives. Bless us this night, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brothers. Amen. It's a privilege to be with you. Blessings to you, okay? Thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. thank you. Bye, -bye. Bye. Thank you, Zach. Thanks. Thanks, bye.